Good morning. Welcome to C1. We're so excited everybody's here today. We're excited to have you back in the house of the Lord, and we're excited to get to worship with you. And we just want to say welcome and good morning if somebody hasn't told you that already today. And if you would like or share or subscribe to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, um, every week, uh, we, every Monday, we post our service. And so maybe you, you found today's service very encouraging. So if you would like to just share it with your friends on Facebook, or you can actually just um, look us up on YouTube and you can send a message to them and share and just tell them how encouraging the, the service was to you. That would be so, so awesome, and we just thank you guys for continuing to do so. And tonight at 6 o'clock is our new life group leader training. So if you are considering leading a life group, you're even relatively curious about what it looks like to lead a life group, and you haven't been through our leader training, tonight at 6 o'clock, this is for you. We're going to have dinner, and we're going to go over exactly what it looks like to lead a life group and answer any questions that you have. So if you plan on coming tonight, please let one of the staff members know so we can count you in for dinner and make sure everybody gets fed. And that right there is a deal. You get dinner and you get to hang out with people. So, I mean, you know, sign me up. I don't have to cook. Um, and so if you are a guest with us, if you have not filled out a Connect card, there are a couple ways where you can do it. If you don't feel like you have time right now, you can always go to our website and you can fill out and, uh, a, new, a new Connect card and that will direct, come directly to us. Or you can do it right here in person and you can hand it to one of the staff members or you can put it back in the offering boxes. But it's basically just a way to, to say hi to you, to let us introduce who we are to you and to answer any questions that you may have about C1. And we just want to say thank you guys so much for being faithful in your giving. It is an amazing opportunity. We have an amazing opportunity to give to God, and we believe the Bible teaches us to be obedient in our giving, and we have experienced firsthand um, what, what, how God can take a little and to make it a lot. And so we just are so grateful for each and every week as you continue to give. And if you would like to give, uh, we have offering boxes just directly out the back off to your right. You can just drop it in the box. You can give online, which is always a great option. Or you can give through our texting, which is you just text the number 84321 and your amount, and that will go directly in. It is an amazing way. If you are not signed up, now the first signing up, you have to first sign up and, and give your, your information. But once you are signed up, it is so easy. I can't even tell you how many times I've just been sitting somewhere or doing something like, oh, I need to give, and I can just text it and give it right away. And so it's very convenient and very easy. And uh, we just want to say, once again, thank you so much for, for your faithfulness. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for allowing us to meet together. And thank you for the opportunity to worship you and to hear from you, Lord. I pray that you would open up our hearts and open up our ears. Let us be receptive to what you have to say today. Remove all the distractions and get us out of the way so that we can hear from you, Lord. And thank you again for the opportunity. In your name, amen. You're welcome to stand if you would like. We're going to go into a time of celebrating Jesus. I don't deserve it 
Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Was your foe, still your love far for me. You have been so, so kind to me. For I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves at 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. All oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me, the wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, you believe that, let's sing it out, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me, oh, the wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me, thank you Lord, and the wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, oh, the over. Reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves a 99 And I couldn't earn it And I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never ending Reckless love of God confidence you never failed me yet. I 
I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love sing your praise again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me your faithfulness faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet oh thank you never failed me yet oh I see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and I believe I'll see you do it again I've seen you move you move the mountains and I believe I'll see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and I believe I see you do it again See you do it again. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless 
In all in wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. You and take my place. You and bear my cross. Lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of Glory, the King of Glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of Glory, the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. You would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Oh, you lay down your life. Thank you, Lord. I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Come on. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. You would take my place. Thank you. You would bear my cross. Oh, you lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for. All that you've done for me. Let's just give it up for the King of Kings. Let's give it up. Come on. We just said, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. What has he done for you? Has he healed you? Has he delivered you? Has he set you free from the power of sin and death? Jesus, we lift you up. Jesus, we magnify your name. We magnify who you are for who you've been to us. You have been good to us. Lord, when we needed peace, you gave us peace. When we needed healing, Lord, you took stripes upon your back. When we needed freedom, you kicked open the doors of bondage. God, we praise your name. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Jesus. I can't help but get excited. I can't help but celebrate Jesus because I know what he did for me. I know what he did for me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, 
Oh, Jesus, we praise your name. Lord, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for the lives that are going to be changed, the trajectories that are going to be changed today. We thank you for meeting with us in the midst of chaos, in the midst of bad times, in the midst of good times. Lord, there's not a bad time to meet with you because if you're there, it's going to change. Can you feel it? I feel like I feel like some stuff is changing right now. Just things in the atmosphere are changing. Hearts are changing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Attitudes are changing. Mindsets are changing. Have your way here today, Father. Holy Spirit, this is your your church. We're here to glorify you. We're here to lift you up. We're here to magnify who you are, God. Lord, I pray that you will be with us. Every heart that needs work, which is every one of us, I pray that you just open us up and do heart surgery on us. God, I truly pray that not one of us will walk out of here the same way we walked in. There are people that walked in with baggage that they they, they need to start the process of laying it down. They need to start the, the process of trusting you with everything. And I pray that that starts here now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Man, you may be seated. You may be seated. Man, God's good all the time. I love, I love coming to church. I love celebrating Jesus with my favorite people in the world. Did you guys know that you guys are my favorite people in the world? Like I say that every Sunday, and every Sunday it's true. I mean, like when I'm at home with my family, they're my favorite people too. But they're here, so. But no, you guys are. I, I love celebrating Jesus with his church. And uh, I can't think of a better way to celebrate Jesus than with his church. And, uh, man, I, 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 as I was worshiping, you know, you have crazy thoughts go through your head. I can't be the only one. And I was just thinking um, how blessed I was as your pastor and how blessed, like, the, the staff just got back from um, a district event, and um, Nathan, Emily, uh, Ben and Ashley, and myself um, were able to go. Um, we kicked Amy out. Um, she didn't make the cut. I'm just joking. <laughs> she, her quarantine didn't end until Wednesday, but uh, she's looking at me like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. She li- gave me that look before, and I've only got stitches. Um, uh, but... I was thinking about how blessed I was as a pastor, and I was talking to other pastors in, uh, th- this week, and I was explaining how God brought this team together, and it was really almost like, it's a miraculous story, and it doesn't make sense, but that's how God works. He works in ways that, do- that don't make sense, and then as I was sitting here, and I was like, man, um, I, I was just bragging on our staff to uh, different pastors, and I was thinking, well, it is quite humbling and so amazing to be the least talented person on staff, and I love it. I'm looking over here, I'm like, Ben can preach, he has an amazing beard, he has, um, um, he could pick up a, he could pick up a guitar, he can sing like an angel, and I'm like, God, what have I been talented with? You can make jokes. I got jokes, and um, Ben has everything else. He has height, and I mean, like, it's amazing. But uh, I'm truly blessed. I I really am. And um, thank you, Ben and Ashley. Thank you, Nathan and Emily. Thank you, Amy, 
for being amazing. Be, guys, um, I'm, I'm blessed. But that has nothing to do with my message. I just needed to say it. Um, we're going to continue in our, our series called How To. And last week I, I mentioned how um, James is like a book that comes along and he's like a coach that says, hey, your shot's broken, but I can fix it. Well, as much as that was true last week, this week it's even more true. This is, uh, this is James saying, okay, um, your shot's really broken, but I'm, we're going to fix it, okay? And so I want us to look at this in the sense of God is working on us, and he's going to change us. Because everything that we're about to read here in James chapter 4, we're going to be looking at 1, um, 1 through 10, hinges on one word. Everything that we're about to hear, every, in fact, this is, might be the biggest thing that we need to work on as a people to walk out the word of God. And that word is humble. Humility. And this is probably the hardest thing to hear. But it is the most, I would argue, that one of the most beneficial things to your walk with God. So we're going to be looking at James chapter 4, 1 through 10. I'm reading now the New Living Translation. So um, let's throw it up here. And James starts with the question, What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it from them. You might think, man, that church has some issues. Before you judge, it just looks different now. You, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers. This is such an encouraging word. Do you guys feel uplifted already? Um, you adulterers. And he, he's putting this in context of, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. So anytime the Bible repeats, and then um, not just repeats in a section of Scripture, but then he turns around and says it, I will say it again, you need to pay attention. Paul does this in Philippians. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Like, there's this emphasis, but especially when the Bible repeats, but when it straight says, I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. He puts adultery in this idea of cheating on God. If you want to be a friend of the world, you alienate yourself from God. God isn't, God isn't doing that part. He always pursues you. But James is saying, you're an adulterer because you're not, you're, you're not faithful to God. And I love how James loops back because in James chapter 1, he talks about if you want wisdom, ask God. But when you ask, don't, don't have your loyalty or, your, or, or, or be unfaithful to God. He kind of loops back to that. He says, don't you think scriptures have no meaning? They, they say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives us grace generously, as the scriptures say. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And then he's about to loop back. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. He hits on this in James chapter 1. He's coming back to it because he understands there's a draw in this world to pull our faithfulness, our loyalty away from God and to, to get our eyes fixed on what the world has to offer. He said, let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. 
And then he ends with, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. What a, what a powerful, powerful scripture. There, I, I guarantee you most of us know that section of scripture that says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And um, I've heard that quoted so many times. I've heard it said so many times, but the context around it is really what we need to focus on because you can resist the devil all day long, but unless you're submitted to God, unless you're humbled before God, he's not going to run from you. He's just going to say it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time because you can't overcome anything on your own. Your willpower isn't strong enough. And it never will be. That's why the Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Everything that we do as a Christian has to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't overcome temptation on our own. We can't, we can't run uh, after God on our own. Everything is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And James is giving us a very clear directive of how to have intimacy with God. And so the only thought I have for you today, and I'm gonna, we're going to break it down and we're going to chew on it, and, um, and we're going to let this thought permeate, hopefully permeate in our mind all week. The thought I want to leave you is how to draw close to God. And you would say, well, he answered that. Draw close to God and God will draw close to you. Yes, but it's so much deeper because the... Drawing close to God is the overflow of humility. And in order to draw close to God, you have got to be humble. This whole section of scripture that we just read, the, 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 the hinge is humility. What's causing quarrels among you? Pride. I want it my way, and they're not giving it to me. I want hymns. Oh, wait, what? No, that, that doesn't count. Uh, let, let, you know, let, 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 I don't like the color of this carpet. Let's talk about some fights in the church. Because, I mean, like, think about the ridiculousness of that statement. Quarrels among the church. We are one body united for one cause. To reach the world for Jesus Christ. And he's saying, what's causing quarrels among you? And last week we hit on it, selfish ambition. But that's rooted in pride. I want it my way. Well, this isn't Burger King. This is the church of the living God. You don't get it your way. You get it God's way. And sometimes as pastors, we make mistakes. And one of the main things I pray for myself is, God, get me out of the way. I need your direction. I don't want to lead this church in my direction. It's doomed for failure. It's going to fail every time if Ryan says, let's do this. But if God tells me, the, and what's crazy is God hardly ever gives a hard yes. He kind of just, I think you should kind of do this. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't know about that. What if they don't like me? He's like, well, who, who are you trying to please here? I'm like, oh, Okay, 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 okay. I'm going to step out in faith. We're going to fully lean into life groups. We're going to nix everything else. We're just going to go with life groups, life groups. And that's what I feel. It's a step of faith. I'm praying about this. Like, What if this is the wrong decision, God? Do you trust me? God, I, you know I trust you, but help my, help my trust in my trust. Just like that dad said, help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. That's a constant tension in my heart as I'm saying, God, I'm, I need your help. But this is his church. What's causing quarrels among you? He asks a simple question. And he's, he's pointing out the basic thing that plagues us all. Pride. Every one of us. Well, I want it this way. I like the way we used to do it. If the way we used to do it worked, we would still be doing it. But it doesn't. Well, that's not nice. I'm sorry. 
that's not in my notes. That's bonus. You can email me at ben at c1.church. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Stop it, Ryan. Get back to your notes. This section hinges on humility. Either a lack of humility or the benefits of humility. What hinders? What hinders are prayers, a lack of humility. He says straight up. He says you don't have because you don't ask. Well, we like that scripture. Oh, we have not because we ask not. Whoo, hallelujah. But when we don't ask with the humble heart before God, he's still not going to get it. We can, get this, we can ask for the right thing with the wrong motives, and God's not going to answer it. If we're asking, God, heal, but we want to take credit, like I prayed that prayer, God's not going to be like, oh, I'm not going to share glory. God, grow your church. And then, well, that pastor's really talented. No, I'm the first to admit I'm not. I'm not. I pray that all the time. But if we pray with the wrong motives for the wrong glory, we're seeking our own glory, if we're having pride in our heart, God's not going to answer it. Hum a lack of humility, pride hinders our prayers, or humility will make our prayers way more effective. What hinders our personal growth? A lack of humility. You have to be humble to recognize you need God. You have to be humble to recognize, man, I am so broken. I'm messed up. God, I need you so much right now. What causes us to pursue our flesh? A lack of humility. Well, I'm strong enough to handle this. No, you're probably not. God in you is strong enough. But when we depend on ourselves over God, there's a lack of hum humility. James goes as far to say that your level of humility directly affects your level of intimacy with God. So if you're very proud, you're not very intimate with God. But if you're very humble before the Lord, your intimacy with God, wow, step back and just watch what God does through you. I wanted to find two words for you real quick. The first word is a word that James wrote for humility. It's hupotoso. Hupo. Actually, I might have mispronounced that. Hupotoso. It says, to arrange under, to subordinate, to subject, put in subjection, to subject oneself, obey, to submit to one's control, to yield one's admission or advice, to obey, be subject. So the word that James used for humble yourself, this is what it meant. And when the early church was reading this letter, this is what they would have understood. This is crux to our relationship with God. This might be the most important thing that we can do in our relationship with God. Everything in our relationship with God will flow out of how we approach God. And if we approach him with pride, we will get nowhere. It will lead to quarrels amongst the church. It will lead to dissension. It will lead to hate. It will lead, man, I, like, it is said that pride is so subtle that it made its way into heaven. It made its way into Lucifer's heart. 
as he's standing, the most beautiful of all God's creation, thinking that he might be able to share in God's glory. That's how subtle it is. And God, the, this is one of the few sins that God actively opposes. Like, God doesn't like sin in general, don't get me wrong, but the Bible straight says God opposes the proud more than once. James is quoting the Old Testament here, but he gives grace to the humble. If you want God to actively oppose you, walk around with pride in your heart. But he gives grace to the humble. That means if you're struggling and you recognize that you're struggling and you need help, in your struggle, that's humility. It's not thinking, I have everything together. It's recognizing the fact that you don't and you need help. Jesus shares a story and he's talking to his disciples and, and he talks about this guy who's praying and he, and he prays a very boastful prayer. Look at me, God. Look at all I have. Look at how much better I am. And I'm paraphrasing. And then he says, look at this guy over here. Look how much better I am than that guy. And then Jesus turns around and says, there's this other dude, tax collector. He comes in and says, God, I'm broken. I'm a sinner. I need you. And then he asks a question. Who did God hear? It was a person who came to him recognizing his need for God. This is how we move forward in our walk with God. This is how we grow in our relationship with God. And I would argue every relationship would benefit from this. I'm not saying that you're a doormat. That's not what this says at all. But if, if, you, if you compile everything in James leading up to this, and you let it build and build and build, Upon this, James, he, he, he says, be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to become angry. That's humility. He says, he says, consider it pure joy when you face trial. You can't do that if you're not humble. You're going to get angry. You're going to get prideful. I can't believe this is happening to me. And the second word I want to define You can't, you can't do the second thing that James tells us to do if you don't walk in the first thing that we just defined. You, you can't draw to God this engizo to bring near, to come, to join one thing to another, to draw or come near to, to approach. I love that. I, I love the idea that God says, he says, draw near to God, he will draw near to to you, to join one thing to another. I, I love that idea of joining one thing to another. I think about these boots. I, I wore them because there is a section of my boots that have an industrial adhesive in them. These are arguably my favorite boots in the world. They are so nasty looking. I've had them for like five or six years. They are so comfortable at this point. But I literally tore the leather. I wore them so much right here. And I took, like, I think it's like E8, D500. It's a flexible industrial adhesive that's like super, like you have to, you're supposed to wear a mask when you're using it. It's really nasty stuff. But I glued it. It's heat resistant. In fact, we fixed our sign with that same glue. It's super heat resistant. It bends. It's waterproof. It's It's amazing. And what it did was it took the foam and it took the leather and it joined it together. And it can't be separated. I, I have walked miles in this. this. This happened like a year and a half ago. I put some miles. I've hiked in these um, because I tore up my other boots. So I figured might as well. They're already tore up. I, but I've, I've done everything. But that, that glue joins it one to another. And what that's what humility and the Holy Spirit does. When we walk close to God in humility, the Holy Spirit steps in and joins us one to another with God. 
And he doesn't just wait for us to go 90. The whole time we're pursuing him, he's pursuing us. And I would even argue when we're not pursuing him, he's pursuing us. The fact that we're all in a relationship, or or hopefully all of us, some of us might not be in a relationship with Jesus, but if you're not in a relationship with Jesus, God's pursuing you. And everyone who is, is a testimony to that, that God pursues you even when you don't draw near to him. But the cool thing is when we make an active effort in humility to draw close to God, he joins us one to another through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. James is giving us a guide to intimacy with God, and it hinges on humility. I would argue that there's probably not a person in here that wouldn't throw up their hand. Like, who wants to draw close to God? Yeah. Everyone, pretty much every one of us. If you didn't raise your hand, that's probably false humility. I'm just joking. I'm joking. But we all want to, we all want to draw close to God. And he's given us a guide. And I, I, want, I want to take and uh, kind of spell out what some of this can look like. How to identify things that come against your humility. If what, if what we want or what we think trumps or aggravates because no one listens to us like if you have to be heard that might be a sign that you need to repent of pride and there's there's a lack of humility if your desires trump everything else in your life if you have got to get credit for what you've done. That might be a sign that there is pride in your heart. If you can't be happy for someone else's success, that might be an example that there's pride in your heart. If you're more worried about having your way than what is right, that's pride. If you care more for the way things appear than how they truly are, like you just want, I want to look like I have a happy marriage. I want to look like my family's all together. I want to look like everything looks good. That's pride in the form of false humility. Now, false humility is still rooted in pride. It kind of looks humble from the outward appearance, but it's still pride. This is scary because pride is very subtle. And James is giving us a, a, a really a roadmap, not even a compass, a roadmap to intimacy with God. And it hinges on humility. Humility affects our prayer life. Humility affects our relationship. Humility benefits every area of our life. But the same can be said of pride. It doesn't benefit. It's a detriment to every area of your life. And it takes a, <laughs> it takes a humble heart to recognize pride. But the beautiful thing that James leaves us with, he says, but if you humble yourself. Some of us are waiting for God to humble you. You don't want God to humble you. The the, the Old Testament is full of examples of when God humbles people. And like, I mean, there were pandemics. I mean, the the whole, the 12, the, the, the plagues in Egypt was an example of God humbling one man. I don't want that. I would rather each of us make a decision in our own heart, say, I'm going to choose to humble myself before the Lord. James says we can, 
and he tells us to do it. And then... And, and it has to be before the Lord because we can, we can humble ourselves before a lot of things. Remember, you know, you can subject yourself to a lot of things. But if you humble yourself before the Lord, it's only God who will lift you up in honor. It's only God who can move in your favor. It's only God that can change your circumstance. So you can humble yourself before a lot of things. But if you're humbling yourself before things that aren't God then it's all for nothing. Humility is a good thing, and it might benefit that relationship, but at the end of the day, the number one thing you need to be worried about humbling yourself before is God. Then God will lift you up in honor. And that humility will pour in to every other relationship, every other area of your life. And some of us think that we can't say mean things and be humble. Some of us think that we can't be confident and be humble. Confident and, confidence and humility work hand in hand, just like arrogance and pride work hand in hand. I would argue that the more you're secure and the more you humble yourself before God, the more confident he'll make you when you need to say truth and love. It doesn't mean that you can't be confident. And a lot of people are like, well, that person's just arrogant. No. The difference between arrogance and confidence Confidence is you're confident in who you are and who God is. Arrogance is it's all about me. James here gives us one of the most important commands in the entire Bible. Humble yourself before God. He actually says it multiple times. Our enemy, Satan, understands something, and I need us to understand something too. The devil knows that a humble Christian is a powerful Christian. Because a humble Christian stands not in their own strength, but in God's. A humble Christian waits on God to move and doesn't try to make it happen themselves. It's really arrogant to think that you can make a miracle happen. It's really arrogant to think that you can force God's hand. A humble Christian said, the Bible says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There is this beautiful thing about waiting and trusting God in his time. A humble humble Christian recognizes the difference between remorse and condemnation. Some of us are stuck in condemnation, and when we hear these verses, like in 8 and 9, it says, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Some of us hear that, and we instantly feel condemned. And that's not the point of that scripture. And I want to I end with this because a humble person recognizes what James is trying to do and what the Holy Spirit's wanting to do in us. James is addressing sin in the church and his pride. And pride doesn't like to be recognized. Pride likes to hide behind other things. Pride dodges and he, and. and Pride's like one of the hardest things for us to recognize in ourselves. But what James is getting at is he's trying to help the church understand the magnitude of sin, the magnitude of pride. And when we recognize it, there should be remorse, but not condemnation. The Bible's very clear. There is now no condemnation for those who who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8, 1. And Jesus took all the condemnation of sin upon himself upon the cross. You don't need to be feeling condemned. But there is a need to feel remorse. When we sin, we don't need to brush it off. Because guess what? Christians sin. What? No, they don't. Yes, we do. As long as we have this flesh and blood body, you are going to sin in this world. And if you don't think you do, well, the Bible says in 1 John, you lie and the truth is not in you. But when we sin, John says in 1 John, 
that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he's writing to the church. So Christians sin. But how we respond when we sin. How do we respond to the Holy Spirit when we sin? We don't need to brush it off like nothing's happened. Like, well, God will just forgive me. I'm hunky-dory. Because that doesn't lead to change. But we don't need to sit in condemnation. Because that doesn't lead to relationship with God. James is telling us we need to reflect on how bad sin is. We need to reflect on what sin did to God. Sin was so bad that it drove God to humanity for 33 years. For three years of ministry, for three hours of purpose on a cross. To annihilate sin. If it was me, I would have just took the weekend. I'm going to step in right here, get crucified, and be back on Sunday. But sin was so bad that God had to spend three, over three decades in human flesh resisting sin in the flesh to overcome the power of sin for us. And we don't need to brush it off. We don't need to be condemned. But we do need to recognize it. We need to feel remorse. Sometimes we need to feel the weight of our sin. And then give it to God. He ends with humble yourself before God. I want to give you a definition. Condemnation is guilt over confessed sin. If you've confessed it to God, you've confessed it, and you're still feeling guilt, that's condemnation, and that's the enemy speaking to you. You need to feel bad about that. The, the enemy steps in when you sin, like, don't go to God. Don't, don't, don't go to God. He doesn't want to hear you. He's disappointed in you. That's not true. That's a lie. The first, according to John and 1 John, the first thing we do when we sin is run to God. The first thing we do is run to God. When you sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. We run to God. The second, this is what we need to understand, the difference. Conviction is guilt over unconfessed sin. Conviction is guilt over unconfessed sin. The Holy Spirit will come in, and when we sin, he will convict us. And he will make us feel what James is talking about. And he will, and, and the, in that, he draws us to him. He's saying, you need to give this to God. Conviction is guilt over unconfessed sin. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you're, you're, you're trying to feel the guilt of what Christ already pled guilty for. So when you confess your sin to God, God steps back and he says, oh, yeah, 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 Jesus died for that. You're not guilty. But when you're not confessing your sin before God, you feel condemned. And the Holy Spirit will convict you. Because he doesn't want you to feel that way. He doesn't want, he doesn't want you, the enemy to work on you. He doesn't want the enemy to say, don't go near to God. God's fed up with you. He's so mad at you. You did it again. You messed up. You had pride. You smarted off. You, you know, whatever it is, you lied. But God's like, no, 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 no. Come to me. Come, 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 come on. Come to me. Just confess it. Confess it. Like, what is it? Oh, Okay. God's not surprised. He already knows. He's like, let me check. Yeah, Jesus died for that one. Oh, you murdered someone. Yeah, Jesus died for that. Oh, um, you're a pedophile. Yeah, Jesus died for that. Oh, you cheated on your wife. Oh, Jesus died for that. Oh, you cheated on your husband. Jesus died for that. Oh, you cheated on your taxes. Yeah, Jesus died for that too. The Bible says God made him who knew no sin to become sin. Jesus became the murderer. He became the pedophile. He became every sin that could ever be committed while he was on the cross. For us, in our place, God made him who knew no sin to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God, the great exchange of what's happening. And the Holy Spirit convicts us to get us to confess with our mouth. And what he really wants out of us isn't a confession of all the sin that we've ever done. Because guess what? I can't even remember. 
I can't remember every sin I've ever committed, every time I've felt pride, every time I've lied, every time. Like, man, well, if we would have known that about you, we would have never voted you in. Oh. I can't remember. Know what the Holy Spirit does to the unbeliever? The only thing he convicts the unbeliever of before they accept Christ as their Lord and Savior is unbelief. That's what Jesus says. He says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of their unbelief. Then he convicts us of righteousness. What does that look like? He comes at you and he says, I just need you to believe that I'm the son of God. That's what he convicts us of. Believe that Jesus is the son of God. When you believe Jesus is the son of God, you're a Christian. And then he comes in and convicts us of righteousness. He reminds us that we're the righteousness of God in Christ. And all these sins that we're dealing with, he's saying, that'll take time. That's called sanctification. But let my Holy Spirit work on you right now. Let's just start right here. Oh, okay, you're a drug addict. Well, let's work on that. Oh, you're dealing with pride. Well, a mission's a really good start. Let's work on that. And as we draw close to God in this walk with God, like James is talking about, he says, draw close to God and he'll draw near to you. You know, what does the Bible say about God? God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, right? First John chapter one, as we draw close to God, what does light do to darkness? It disperses it. So as we draw close to God, this process called sanctification takes place. And as I'm going after God, the Lord's like, dude, you really need to work on this in your life. You need to love your wife a little more. You need to, and he starts exposing dark areas in my own life because God is light. There's no darkness in him. So as he draws near to me and I draw close to him, he's joining us. But in that process, he's exposing darkness and he's saying, work on that. We have it backwards in the church. We want God to change everyone. We want God to get rid of the sin out of their life before they even believe that Jesus is the Son of God. No, Jesus says, just believe that I'm the Son of God, and that, time, that stuff takes time. But the point is to let God work on you. And you can't let God work on you if you're full of pride. James... He wants us to understand. Some of us are feeling that conviction. Don't feel condemnation. God's not here condemning anyone. He condemned Jesus. So you don't have to be condemned. But some of us are feeling conviction. There are things I need to give to God. Maybe it's pride. But I'm going to do something that I didn't do last week. I asked you guys to prove it last week. I'm going to ask you guys to prove it in a different way. This week. If, if the Lord is working on your heart and you need to confess some stuff before God, you need to humble yourself before the Lord, I'm going to ask you to swallow your pride and find a place to pray. You can pray up here. You can pray along the side. You can turn around and pray in your chair. You can come and ask me to pray for you. Maybe the Lord is asking you to go ask for forgiveness of someone in this room. Oh, you, you had to go there? You had to go there, Ryan? Really? That's a hard one. Yeah, pride will say don't do it, just FYI. And God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. But we have this opportunity to humble ourselves before the Lord this morning. The first act of humbling before the Lord, though, is recognizing that I'm a sinner. Recognizing that I don't believe in God. Saying, Jesus, I believe in you. If you never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to be right here. My wife's going to be right over here. We want to pray with you. We want to lead you into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the one decision you will never regret. It's the one decision that can change everything in your life. It is the one decision that will change your eternity from hell to heaven. But it starts with humbling yourself before the Lord. The very act of saying, God, I need you as my Savior is an act of humility. Our whole walk hinges on humility. So as Ben leads us, I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm going to ask that you don't listen to fear and you don't listen to pride. In fact, I'm, I'm going to rebuke those off of us. 
And then I'm going to ask that faith rises up in us to step out in faith to do what the Holy Spirit asks us to do. Father, I pray right now for your church. Lord, you are working in each of our hearts. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, that it's exactly what we need to grow in you right when we need it. To go after you. So Lord, I pray right now against all pride and I rebuke all fear. In the name of Jesus, I release power, love, and a sound mind. I release humility to be obedient to what you're leading us to do in this moment. And Lord, I pray that not one of us walks out of here listening to pride over your Holy Spirit. Not one of us walks out of here listening to fear over your Holy Spirit. In your mighty name, Jesus, I ask. Amen. As Ben starts to lead, I would encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit and how he's leading you to respond. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. your fault steal your love far from me you have been so so good to me when I felt no worth you paid it all for me you have been so so kind to me Oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Oh it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves a 99 I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god yeah Coming after me 
No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Hold oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found least 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the Reckless love of God. God's not going to move, that you're, you, you can't get healed, but I, I just pray that you just eradicate that right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, as they humble themselves, that you lift them up in honor, that you just lift them up right now, that you remind them of who they are in you, that you are their father, that you are the king of kings, and that, you, that they are co-heirs with you, Jesus. Remind them that you already fought the war. Lord, I just rebuke every lie. And I, I'm just, I, I just feel like there, there's some people in this room that have been listening to the lies of and he's been he's been writing whole narratives in your mind and they've been running all around and I, I just I just feel like I need to remind you who the author of lies is the enemy of our souls is writing that book in your mind and he's trying to destroy you. He's trying to depress you. He's trying to make you anxious. He's trying to get you to depend on yourself and not on God. He's, he's just running rampant. And I just want to remind you of who the author of truth is. And God says that you are his, that he is more than enough, that he promises to provide for our needs. The enemy keeps telling you that he's not going to provide. He's not going to show up. He's not going to do. But that's not what God says. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And he is going to show up. And he is showing up. I pray right now, Father, that you will reconcile people's minds to your truth right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, help them to recognize every time you provided for them in the last week. And Lord, help them to look forward to every time you're going to provide. Provide healing, provide encouragement, provide, uh, oh, joy, provide, oh, God, everything that you promise. 
I just rebuke it off of your church in the mighty name of Jesus. You have no authority here, depression. Get off. You have no authority, anxiety. Get off. Oh, Jesus. Lord, let there be life. Lord, let there be joy. Let there be a changed mind, like your word tells us in Romans 12. As we humble ourselves and make ourselves a living sacrifice, pure and holy and pleasing to you, Lord, change the way we think. I thank you, Lord, that this is a launching pad. Lord, that people are going to walk out of here with new perspectives, that people are going to walk out of here in humility, they're going to walk out of here in confidence, they're going to walk out of here on fire, they're going to walk out of here looking for opportunities for you to use them this week. You're going to, that they're going to walk out of here wanting to change this world for your kingdom. Not feeling disqualified, I just rebuke that disqualif- disqualifying uh, spirit off of this church. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that as people go home and they start contemplating about life groups, that you bring them back. Tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great week. Looking forward to this year. It's been a good one. Next year's going to be better. Have a blessed week. Don't forget Life Group Leaders training. New life tonight at 6.